Hear now the word of God, Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 16. Awake, O north wind, and come, thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O beloved. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? My beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels or heart were moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if ye find my beloved, that ye tell him that I am sick of love. What is thy beloved more than another beloved, O thou fairest among women? What is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among ten thousand. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. His lips like lilies, dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with the barrel. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. May God bless the reading of his word to our hearts as well as our minds. Well, a common complaint in marriages, it's very common, you see this in marriage counseling all the time, is one spouse desires to be with the other and the other has little interest in being with their spouse. Or when they are together, right, it is not an interest in the spouse that dominates, but maybe it's the phone and checking it and scrolling it. And the time spent seems almost wasted. There's no time quality that is being spent with the beloved. In so many marriages, this is a problem. Um, This is not probably just an issue in your marriage, but it is aggravated in so many. And this often leads to a breach in relationship. It leads to a deadening of the marriage and joy that was once there seems lost. Love has cooled, as the Lord Jesus said himself, you have left your first love. That love of espousals seems completely gone. Sad to say, the same phenomenon happens with the believer and the Lord Jesus Christ, though the problem is never on his end. It's always on our end. It's so interesting, isn't it, when we think of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is never the disinterested party, but we are. The Lord of glory, the Holy One, is not the one disinterested in this relationship, this marriage bond, but we are. Isn't there something twisted about that? Isn't there something perverse about that? He that is when we are at our very best, the one we say, he that is altogether lovely, whose mouth is most sweet, the chiefest among 10,000, the greatest man, the greatest of all, the God man, 
We are disinterested in him, and yet he says he is not disinterested in us. In fact, he comes to us. He says, I knock, open to me, my beloved. And we say, I'm just a bit tired to deal with you. I'm really not interested in spending time with you. It's staggering that he is more interested in the communion table next week than we are. I think when you put it that way, it just becomes shocking, doesn't it? It shows us where our heart is. How sad it is that we are the ones who are often lethargic and lukewarm when it comes to him. Our love is often very cold, though his love is as strong as death. He comes to the soul. He comes to the door of the soul, knocking, ready to commune with us. And we say, in effect, I'm tired. I cannot be bothered to pray, Lord. I cannot be bothered to hear you speak to me. I cannot be bothered to show up to the public meeting. Or if I do all these things, and maybe this is you now, it's often been me. My body is really, and my mind is in the bed. My mind is in the world, and I'm not engaged with my Lord, who is saying, even now, open to me, my beloved, and my mind is on Monday. My mind is on entertainment. My mind is on my sorrows. My mind is on my grief. And I totally miss the voice of my beloved. I'm not engaged with him. My soul is not enjoying fellowship and communion with him. Well, next week, we will have what is the highest and most intimate form of communion with our Lord Jesus Christ, the side of glory. Today, he stands at the door of your soul knocking. And he says from our text, and this is him. Addressing you, believer, I will establish it later. And he says to you, listen to this, open to me, my spouse, my love, my beloved, my friend, my undefiled, my sister. He says, open to me. That's him speaking to you right now. And the question is, what is your response to the Lord? When he says, open to me, put away everything else, and open your heart, your mind, your soul to me, all of your strength. Come away from the spiritual slumber that has overcome you over these past weeks as you prepare to meet with me. He says, do not delay. Do not hasten. Approach me and wipe the spiritual slumber from your eyes. He says, arise and come to me, my love. Open to me, lest in your delay you find that I have departed. He withdraws in this text, doesn't he? Because of the slumber of the bride. And so when he says, open to me, we are not to delay. That's the issue in our text for the bride. She finds when she does not respond in a timely way, her beloved has departed and withdrawn. And so we are to swiftly respond today when the Lord says, open to me, my beloved, lest we find that our communion with Christ is not what it ought to be. And so with that introduction to set our theme, our theme is swiftly responding to Christ's desire to communion. Swiftly responding to Christ's desire for communion. And we'll consider it under the four heads on your bulletin. First is the bride's request. Second is the beloved's invitation. Third is the bride's slumber. And fourth is the beloved's withdrawal. And it follows the the tenor of our text, the contour of our text here. Those four headings do. So first is the bride's request. Well, we've been in the Song of Solomon for a few years now. Um, This may be very well my final message to you out of this text, out of this book before I depart. But I don't think I need to defend to this congregation any longer that this book is of Christ's love, the mutual love of Christ and his church for each other. That's what this book is of. Let me remind you of that truth briefly so that it is not forgotten And you remember it always. You remember how Ephesians 5, we saw this at the wedding recently, teaches us that the mystery of marriage reveals the gospel. That's what it does. It reveals the gospel. That the good news, the gospel, is in effect the love of Jesus Christ for his bride to save her from her sinfulness so that she may enter into this blessed communion, this marital estate with him where they may love each other for all eternity. That's what marriage pictures. And so the beloved in our text must be Christ and the church is the bride. That's especially clear. It's very interesting. 
uh, this text because that is clear as our text is referenced as you heard it in Revelation 3 verse 20 where Christ is at the door knocking and saying, sup with me. I'll speak on that a bit later and how it's connected to our text. But that is a connection to the Song of Solomon. So we interpret the Song of Songs, which is what this book is called in its very first verse, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. We interpret the book as pointing us to the love of loves. Right? Song of Songs, that's a Hebrew, Hebrew superlative, seeing this is the best and the greatest of songs. Well, it points us to the love of loves. I'll ask this question often of your children, but what is the love of loves? What is the greatest love? It's the love of Christ for his church. There is no greater love. There can be no greater love. The greatest love between husband and wife here, it pales. It's a shadow. It's a a mere shadow of the love of Christ for his church. This is the song of songs. We have the love of loves. And how does Paul summarize the love of loves? That the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. And how does he live in view of it? He lives his life as a return of love to the Son of God who loved him. His life is now Christ's. You know, Galatians 2.20 then is in effect a summation of the key verse of this book. Chapter 6, verse 3. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. You can think of Galatians 2.20 in that way. I am my beloved's. He loved me and gave himself for me. And now I am his. All of me is his. So brethren, in the Song of Solomon, one greater than Solomon is here. One greater than Solomon is here with a love greater than Solomon's. It is our Lord Jesus Christ. And whatever is in this book, Is Jesus Christ telling you, his beloved, of his love for you? How great it is, how glorious it is, so that you take the love that you read in the rest of the scriptures and then you find it here in this beautiful book, almost expositing the love Christ has for you personally and the church corporately. So this book is for every believer, whether they be married or not. Every believer says, see, I am my beloved's and I return his love. My beloved is mine. So if you're single or you're in a difficult marriage or maybe you're widowed or divorced, don't you dare skip this book. In fact, so many who are single for whatever reason skip this book. Oh, this is a marriage manual. I guess it is a marriage manual if you're thinking of Christ and his church. It does teach you about the greatest love of all, the one that you possess. And the the thing is that you who are a Christian see how greatly you are loved and desired by Jesus Christ, though you are a sinner like me. And we say how wonderful it is to be loved by God like this. Satan hates this book and wants to make it something to you carnal and earthy rather than heavenly. Because this book unlocks the deepest and greatest communion with Christ and he hates you having that. And that's why so many teach that this is is just a carnal kind of book. But it's not. It's a heavenly book of the greatest love. Well, let us now enter our text. And we'll begin at the end of chapter 4. Because the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5 ought not be divided. Often you will have a paragraph marker in uh, verse 16 that does not um, begin a new paragraph marker in chapter 5, showing you that even translators understand this. The chapter divisions are, are not inspired children. They come later. They're helpful for us, but they're a reference, uh, uh, they're for use in reference and not so much for narrative flow. But chapter 4, verse 16 begins... Uh, this division. Um, At the end of chapter 4, the bride said, let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. That's a prayer. And it's a rather fitting one as we prepare for communion this week. Let us understand it to better pray. What's the garden being spoken of? It's the church. God often calls the church his vineyard. Consider how the Song of Solomon and Isaiah 6.1 could be connected. 
Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. That's the same language of love, isn't it? The vineyard there in Isaiah 6 is the church. It's in context the people of God. And our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, speaks of the church as a vineyard as well. He even says he is the vine and we are, children, the branches. That imagery is everywhere. So what do we make of this prayer that we would have the Lord Jesus Christ eat of his pleasant fruits in the church? Well, we're asking him to partake of our fruitfulness. What is the work of the Spirit called? Right? It's the fruit of the Spirit, isn't it, children? You know the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians. What does the Lord do as he works in us? He trims us, he prunes us. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And the fruit of our union with Christ is that our graces grow in us and we are fruitful for the Lord. He who is the vine dresser wants to then, you think of what this means, wants to partake and taste of the fruitfulness that he works in us. This is part of our communion with the Lord. That is why he who is most fruitful to the Lord has the deepest communion with the Lord. Because the Lord Jesus Christ enjoys uh, dining, as it were, upon the soul that generates fruit for him. You know, it's a, a mysterious thing, perhaps, but the Lord enjoys tasting his own works in our soul. And I think if we would recognize that, we would seek to bear more fruit for the Lord. He enjoys having in us the spiritual fruit he himself has caused to grow and ripen as we put on the new man by his grace. And that's his own work after all in us, right? He inspects us as the vine dresser. And that's a motivation, as I've just said, that we often lack in our sanctification. That as we are sanctified, as we bear fruit for the Lord, our communion with him deepens as he delights in us. This is the love of complacency that we have talked about before, that love of delight. He actually delights to be in our soul as it bears fruit for him. And so the Christian who delights in having communion with the Lord, to have him near and dear to them, to have him in their soul feeding um, them, to enjoy communication with the Lord, they will want to bear fruit knowing that he delights to be in his garden. And this is, of course, why the Lord prunes those who do not bear fruit. John 15, 5 through 6. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Does Christ want to sup with those who bear no fruit, friend? No, they're cast into the fire. He comes to partake of the fruit of his graces as the farmer right, enjoys seeing his crop grow and he pulls from his crop and he is delighted in how the crop has turned out and takes enjoyment in it because this is his work in you. He delights to taste of it. And so let us delight to give it to him and ask for the grace to be fruitful. Even at the Lord's table, right? We come to the Lord's table and we say, Lord, make me fruitful through the supper itself that you would have more to dine on yourself. So the Lord delights in tasting his own fruitfulness in us, and that's something to wonder at. So this prayer can be interpreted like this. O oh, beloved son of David, right? We think of the son of David, Solomon, but we're thinking past him. O oh, beloved son of David, come and meet thy church and taste of thy fruits. This would be a good prayer for us this week as we think on the table. Let's pray it for the communicants in this church. Let's pray it not just for ourselves, but for each other too. We're going to see the daughters of Jerusalem later on. And she goes to them and she asks them to pray. Let us pray for each other. Let us pray that not just in my soul, selfishly, Christ would delight in, but in every soul that comes to that table next week, that Christ would delight in each of them. This is one way that we can lift up our brethren in prayer. Make my brother, make my sister fruitful, O God. Because... The reason we're doing it is so that Christ would have something to delight in at the table. 
And we're looking at him and we're saying, have that love of delight, of complacency at Dallas RPC, that we would delight our Lord. Now, as we prepare this week, practically, and your mind may have gone here already, I trust it probably has, there is a species of fruit that the Lord really does delight to taste of. What did we hear at the very opening of the gospel? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. Now, we've talked about this in the parable of the prodigal, but I think if you connect the Lord's delight in the fruitfulness of his people with the grace of repentance, we actually find the delight of repentance is the Lord himself delights to see it in us, and he delights to commune in the repentant soul. Because this is one of those fruits that he enjoys to see in his people. So let us dive into our heart this week. And let us gladly repent of sin. Knowing it will heighten our communion with the Lord. And we can bear such fruit this week in this area ahead of us. So that we would bear fruits meet for repentance that the Lord would enjoy to taste in us. Ask the Lord in fervent prayer. Give me the graces thou hast promised to me as well. Faith. Hope and charity, doesn't he delight to see these in us? Doesn't he delight to see the, the faith, the grace of faith, that trust and love of him expressed through faith? Hope, all of my hopes upon the Lord, wherever I have put hope in something else, let me put my hope first and foremost in the Lord. Wherever I have been bitter at his providence, let me put that away and let me put my hope in God. And charity, love for God, where it is cold, where my love for other things are greater than for him. Let me put that away. And let me be reminded at the end of this chapter who my beloved is, chiefest among 10,000, and that no love under heaven or earth can compare to my beloved. Oh, would he not love to dine on that fruit? Let the fire of love burn in your bosom. Ask the Lord to blow upon you and nourish you and give you fruit that you might have him to dine on your soul. Christ responds to this in five, chapter 5, verse 1. I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. Now there's a, Beautiful picture. We can't cover every aspect of every verse, and I, I can't try to do that today. But there's so many beautiful pictures here. And one I want to put before you is she had prayed, and here's this beautiful picture that before she finishes asking, he answers her. I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. He responds so swiftly to us when we will engage him. You know, our Lord, when he taught the Lord's Prayer, said what? Your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask of him. If you desire him, he knows you desire him. And he will answer swiftly as soon as those words come into your heart. But why does he then, in the Lord's Prayer, tell you, though your Father knows what you want and what you need, pray anyhow. He draws you to prayer. He wants you to pray and he acts in accordance with it to draw you into this communication with him. Prayer itself is a form of communing with the Lord. And so he wants you to engage with him. Uh, he knows the, the desires of your heart, but he shows you here, he wants this communication with him. He wants you to be engaged with him, to show that you're engaged with him. And so prayer comes to us. But the Lord has given us gracious promises, like in Isaiah 65, 24. Before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. All these things draw us to prayer, to connect prayer with the gracious answers the Lord gives us. But why would he possibly want us to pray then? So that we may commune with him, that we might communicate with him, that we might know him. If you truly desire the fruit of a vital life-giving union with Christ, if you express it in prayer before the words come out of your lips, the prayer is answered. The prayer itself is an answer to that. You say, Lord, I desire communion with you. As you've prayed, you've communed with him. And he has answered you. 
Desire then this week that he would find fruit in his garden, especially the fruit of repentance and faith. He will give it, he will find it, and you will enjoy greater fellowship with him. That takes us to our second heading, the beloved's invitation. He has given an invitation here in our text. You've heard it. Come and eat and drink abundantly. Now, I'll talk on the abundance of the invitation in a moment. But first, let us start with the titles he uses to address his church. He calls us what? My sister, my spouse, my friends. Isn't that endearing? Isn't that endearing, friends? Oh, how endearing it is. The church is his sister. You know this. He took on flesh to be our elder brother. The church is his spouse. He is flesh of our flesh and bone of our bones to be wed to us. The church is his friend. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. John 15. I have marveled, as you ought to as well, how multidimensional our relationship is to God in Christ. That not a single human relationship can capture the fullness of it. Have you thought on that? Beloved, father, brother, friend, spouse are all in all. All of these relationships, not a single one can capture the totality of who he is to us. He has to use all these titles. And so, dear ones, Christ invites you to the communion with the most touching titles for you. Aren't these sweet words to you? They ought to be. There's something wrong with us if they're not. To hear the God-man call you these things. He doesn't simply say, my subjects, this would have been fine. My subjects, come to the feast with me. Come to the feast with me, my subjects. Right? It's interesting, John 15, henceforth I call you not servants. But let me put that aside for a moment. We are the servants of Christ. But he doesn't say, my subjects, my royal subjects come. But he endears you. He draws you to him. My sister, come. My spouse, come. My friend, come to me. And with these titles then, could we doubt that we are invited? Could we doubt that we can come? Does a queen doubt an invitation to the king's table? Does she say, no, that's insincere. He doesn't really mean for me to be there. Does she say, he wouldn't show up to the feast and he certainly would not have me sit at his right hand? No, the queen doesn't doubt it because she is his queen. A mere subject might fear to come thinking such an invitation is insincere or duplicitous or there's some other ulterior motive. Is the king going to have my head? But not the queen, not the best friend, not the sister. They do not fear. The king is sincere to them. So believer, his invitation is sincere. Do you not know who is calling you to himself? Reverse the titles. Your husband your elder brother, your king, your best friend. He is calling you to himself. And he says to you, friends, come, eat and drink abundantly. Take all that I have. I hold nothing back from you. All that I am and all that I have is yours. Dine on the source of your fruitfulness. You know, if we would think of the communion invitation in this way, think of the riches that are set before us if we would grab hold of it by faith. Yes, it will be a small sip of wine. Yes, it will be a small taste of bread. But oh, what a great taste of Christ it will be. And how he is able to fill our souls. There is not anything in him that lacks. We are to come by faith in the promise that as we take of that bread and we sip of that white, we are, wine, we are taking abundantly of Christ. He gives us more than a bare minimum, but grace overflowing to leave us full and satisfied. Here's the question, right? And sometimes we, we think so severely of our Lord. Did Christ regenerate us and then sort of put us on spiritual life support? You get the bare minimum to sort of keep you going until you die. 
No. He said, I have come to give you life and life abundantly. Abundantly. How much of Christ is there for you to have? Did he give you a quota? Did he give you a limit, believer? No. What does he say? Be filled with the fullness of God. Be filled with the fullness of God. You are to be filled with a love that excels or exceeds all understanding, whose height and depth and breadth and length exceeds every dimension because he exceeds every dimension. Now he says the believer will be filled with the fullness of God, filled to the brim. And he says, eat and drink abundantly, friends of Christ. Take all of me. Don't be afraid. Ask for what you desire. You desire more of me, I will give it to you and I will give you abundantly. Have we the faith to ask for such things? Give me more of thyself. Is he not the greatest gift after all? We should ask for all of him. Take all of Christ. And here's the challenge. I dare you to. I dare you to. You are to have bold prayers in this area, aren't you? I need more of Christ. Give me all of Christ. And when you've had all that your soul can fill, there's more of Christ beyond that. And you can be filled and filled and filled. And for all eternity, you will be filled. Because there's more of Christ that can fill your soul. And so he says, come, take abundantly. I can fill all believers a billion times over and there will be an infinite amount of me left over. Take abundantly of Christ. You need much grace? There's more than enough grace in Christ. Take and eat abundantly, friends of Christ. He is immense and that is so satisfying to the soul. And what does it mean to you to have a love like this, inexhaustible? You know, there are limits, right? There are times you can be very honest because we are creatures and we are also sinful creatures at that. There are limits. Even as a minister, I feel it so often and I need to be on my knees more. There seems to be limits to our love, how much we can love another. I say, I wish I could love this person more. I wish I could do more. I wish I could spend more time in prayer or whatever it is, but Christ has no limits. He can fill you abundantly and his love is inexhaustible. You need love today. You can go to him. You need grace today. You can go to him. Whatever ails you, he is there to fill you. And this is part of the joy of knowing communion with God through Jesus Christ. He says, come to me, all of you that are weary and heavy laden. Whatever the weight of the burden is, I can take it. And I can fill your soul with strength to bear it. Desire to be filled with the fullness of God and I will answer before you even ask. Let's consider verses two to four next. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh saying, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? My beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door and my bowels removed for him. Once again, hear how Jesus speaks of you. He repeats these addresses. My sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. O saints, plagued as you are with the sin nature, would you see how Jesus sees you in himself? In him, and I want to focus on this one title. We've thought of the others. My undefiled. That seems far from us as we prepare for communion, doesn't it? My undefiled. But in him, you are undefiled. You are pure. You are unspotted. He's not ashamed to call you my undefiled, though so much sin remains. Why can he say it? Well, first, because God sees you through Christ. And he sees Christ's perfect righteousness. And there is not a spot on it. There's not even a wrinkle upon it, as I recently preached to you. You are undefiled, robed in Christ's own righteousness. The Lord, my righteousness. You are undefiled judicially. Praise God. But there's more than that. One day you will be totally undefiled. Have you forgotten the truth of the gospel? 
He will make you undefiled in glory. Even now, even this moment, in the preaching of the word, He is working in you to remove sin from you in sanctification. So let me ask you this. Is it wrong for Jesus to call you today what you will be in a few short years or decades? No, you are His undefiled. Because that is what He is making you. And that is what He knows for certain you will be because of his work in you. And so the believer always has to see themselves through Christ. He is not ashamed to call you brethren, for he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. You are his undefiled as well, because he is sanctifying you. You know, even as we want to bear fruit, meet with repentance, what encourages us in the pursuit is that Jesus produces in us sanctification. And as he's producing it, we know the Bible promises what he has begun, he will complete. That is a certainty. He has begun something in you, believer, and he will bring it to completion so he can say with the fullness of truth, you are my undefiled because that is what you will be. And that is what you are to me. Let us then ask the Lord to give us grace this week to remove our uncleanness from our soul, that our lust and desire for sin will be removed, that he would see in us more of what we will be one day, that we will bear the imprint of what we are in our soul, of what we will be perfectly one day, because we know he enjoys that in us, so let us ask for it. He doesn't doesn't want to see his bride defiled. That's why he's making her undefiled. Well, these are things to be praying for as we prepare for communion. The Lord Jesus here, though, visits his bride and he says, open to me, my love. Open to me. He's telling the soul to be open. Open thy mind. Open thy heart. Open thy soul, as our Lord Jesus said, with all thy might. Open all of yourself to me. He put his hand by the hole of the door and he invites his beloved to communion with him. He says, I am here. Will you open the door to me? He calls. What's her response? It's rather tragic. She does not appreciate who is calling. Let's consider that in our third head, the bride's slumber. Her soul is lethargic towards him. She makes excuses that it is just too difficult to meet him. And really, as you think on these excuses, I'll read them to you. You think about how ridiculous it is that we would never answer the Lord when he calls. She says, I have put off, this is verse three, I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? Now, children, imagine the bride here on her bed laying, and uh, maybe she feels chilly outside of it. And while Jesus says, it seems to be raining outside, I'll get to that in a moment. While Jesus says, open to me, she says, well, I'd have to go put my coat on. I'd have to put my robe on. And I'm just very comfortable in the bed right now. It's very comfortable right here. And it'd just be too much effort to get up. I've already washed my feet. My feet are not dirty right now. And if I do walk to the door, there's, I think, many spiritual illustrations there we don't have time for, then I'll defile my feet in order to get to the door. It's just too much for me to bear with. These are really ridiculous things, I think you understand the point of this text, right? Here is her beloved, the one that she says she loves above all. And she says, well, I've had to put a coat on in order to get to the door. This text is perhaps one of the best illustrations of spiritual slumber and how ridiculous it is, ultimately, that we do not respond to the Lord's calling. It feels inconvenient for us to meet with Christ. And as he invites us, we will not go. And if you've been a Christian for any length of time, I think you understand where this is going and where your soul has been far too often, mine too, mine too. But I think as you've been, if you've been an elder or a minister, you also see this in the people of God so often. And this certainly does provoke our soul. But how much it must provoke the Lord. 
you think about excuses, right? Think about yourself. I'm a bit tired on the Sabbath morning, so I will sleep in and not go to worship. Even though the Lord is saying, open to me, my love, because when you come to the assembly, I will meet you. I'm just a bit tired, though, Lord Jesus. Uh, I'm going to hit the snooze a bit longer on the alarm and miss worship. Even though he is saying, my beloved, open to me and I will come in. At home, the Bible is maybe on your nightstand, gathering dust. Maybe it's been untouched for days because after scrolling around on your phone or watching television, right, you just say something like, well, I'm pretty tired now. My mind is shot. I'm going to go to bed. Even though the Lord Jesus Christ with the Bible before you is saying, open to me, my beloved. Well, I'm just a bit fatigued right now. And I've got to charge my phone anyway, so I need to go. The bride here is doing the same kinds of things we do. And it is a terrible thing when we know who it is that is calling us to commune with him, that we would make excuses like this. The bride also, as we've come through this book, shows how hot and cold we are towards Christ. You know, she had just expressed a yearning desire for him to come, a prayer in verse 16 in chapter 4. But when he comes to her, she has no desire for him. How often we pray. Maybe tonight you will pray, Oh Lord Jesus, come. And then throughout the week, he becomes tiresome to you. And then maybe you'll rem remember him um, Lord's Day morning when, Oh, we have communion today. We can be hot and cold, can't we? I think we understand this from experience. And as he approaches, actually, it seems like there's a kind of wrestling in her heart. She sort of understands the dilemma. I sleep, but my heart waketh. How often has the Lord Jesus Christ said something like this, right? Um, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. And that's sort of what she's at right now. She's basically saying, I do on some level desire my beloved. My heart is awake, but I am slumbering. How often do we slumber spiritually? And our conscience is actually provoked by it, but we don't do anything about it. Right? We know it's wrong. We know it's the better portion to be at the feet of Christ and to pray. Right? We're convicted at times by it, but our heart doesn't move us to actually get up and go. How many times in the morning right, you wake up and you say, you know, I ought to spend some time with the Lord. Well, that's your heart. It's awake, but you slumber and you don't go. And that's what the bride is feeling here. Right? She knows she ought to do it. So this is a picture of the beloved, not the, uh, of the, the believer, not the unregenerate. This is something we wrestle with. We ought to contend against it. You know, how many of us right this moment might be bewailing our spiritual lethargy? Christ saying, even now, open to me, my beloved, but yet we're continuing in our spiritual slumber even now. My heart's awake, but I slumber and I sleep. This is something that we need divine help with, don't we? We need help with this. How about many of us who go home after a sermon that convicts us, but ignores the Lord's calling to open our lives to him and to put away the things that have robbed communion with him? I sleep, but my heart waketh. That's the condition of so many of us believers. I'll go back to something I said before. Our Lord Jesus Christ uses this text in the Revelation 3.20. We read it. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. That's him at your door saying, open to me, my beloved, and I will commune with you. Isn't that what he's saying? What does he desire of the bride? He desires communion with her. Open to me, my beloved. He promises if you open the door straight away, if you engage him to commune with him, he will come in and he will sup with you and you will sup with him. Now, it's very interesting as we draw connections here. What church was it the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to in Revelation 3.20? The church at Laodicea. How was it characterized? Lukewarm. Lukewarm. Neither hot nor cold. It's fitting that Christ lifts his words from this text of sluggishness to bring to that church. Perhaps our church, the Dallas RPC, is Laodicea. Maybe we need to contend with these words. 
Maybe we need to respond to the Lord more swiftly. I don't know. You need to consider yourself. So saints, he calls you to commune with him, to open your heart to him. Do not just assent that you love him when he says, open to me, my beloved. He says, go to me as well. Come to me, open to me. He is calling you to communion, saints, to put away sin and idolatry and worldliness, to meet with him. Who in this place is Christ speaking to? Who is hearing his voice now? You are to respond to him. He says, he is knocking. He is saying, open to me, my love. Who hears that? Who among here hears him say that to them? What is your response? It is appropriate to do a work right now with the Lord. He says, open to me. Why will you not open? Why will you not fling the door open? Say, take all of me. Come in and enter. I'm not going to open the door, crack and look out like I do with a salesman who comes door to door. And maybe some of you will experience that as you go door to door tonight. No, you are to fling the door open, wide open. All of your soul bear before the Lord. Pray as the Lord instructed. O oh Lord, help me, the poor slumbering sinner who cannot wait, uh, watch and wait for a mere hour. Help me. Well, to have us respond swiftly. Let us tremble at the beloved's withdrawal. Verses four and five. My beloved put his hand by the hole of the door and my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved and my hands dropped with myrrh and my fingers with sweet smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. The bride's sluggishness was removed at Christ's entreaty to open. Her bowels, her heart was moved for him. And this happens as well. Some of you are now convicted and your heart is being moved for him. And she goes up, her sluggishness is removed and she goes to the door because her heart is moved for him and I hope your heart is moved for him. But what did it? When he called her to open, he said his hair was wet with the rain of the night. In other words, she recognizes that he has gone through some level of discomfort to come and commune with her. He has not come when it is cheery and pleasant out, but rather when there is a downpour and it requires something of him to be there. And he knocks at the door in the midst. You can almost imagine the kind of scene of a, a husband coming to the door of his wife and he's drenched and he's knocking on the door, continually being drenched and saying, open to me, my love. And suddenly her heart is moved by that when she recognizes the pains that he has taken to come and visit with her. So as you approach communion, you remember that in order to have communion with him, our Lord underwent great misery. When his disciples were sleeping in Gethsemane, our Savior was groaning as they were slumbering. He sweated, as it were, great drops of blood coming down while they snored. That we may have communion with him. He comes to us via a crown of thorns. His head was bloodied with drops of blood, clouding his own eyes. Yet even as his eyes were clouded with his own blood, he could see. He could see beyond the cross to the joy that was set before him of having communion with you. The contrast with what Christ has done to commune with us, with what is required of us to commune with him, is quite remarkable. We just must put down the phone and go to prayer. We must just pick up our Bible by faith and read. We just must not overextend ourselves on Saturday in order to have communion with him on Sunday. And that's too much. But he had to go to a cross. He had to be broken. He then knocks at the door after all of that, saying, open to me, my love. I have come to you by way of a cross. I have conquered death itself so that I can commune with you. But I am found asleep when he says it and say, but Lord, I would have to put on my coat. 
What a contrast that is. Our hearts ought to be moved at the thought of it. But better late than never, the bride's heart was indeed moved as she meditated that her beloved had prayed, uh, paid such a price as that. As we prepare for communion, we are called to affectionately meditate on the sufferings of Christ, what he did on the cross so that he could have communion with us. So that will engage our hearts to swiftly open the door when we think on him in that way continually. How he has loved us. As the Jews marveled at the graveside of Lazarus, behold how he loves. They were moved by that. Themselves, the enemies of Christ, and how often the friends of Christ, the spouse of Christ, is not moved by that. Ache. For he that gave himself for you this week. Well, she goes to the door handle. And her hand is said to be dripping with myrrh. It's as though he who drips with myrrh, the Lord Jesus, left his fragrance on the handle. And she has a reminder of his special presence that was once there. She is not destitute of a token of him. But what happened when she opened the door? I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave no answer. At times in our lethargy, friends, Jesus withdraws himself from us. Why? To keep us from taking him for granted. He is very gracious to be there for us so often, but he will not be taken advantage of. He absolutely will not be taken advantage of. He is in control of communion with you. He is not your genie to show up on demand whenever it's convenient for you. Okay, I now have some time to spend with the Lord. Why is it that he seems so distant? Don't be surprised if you give him the scraps of time and you don't find him so nearby. He will not be toyed with. Confession of Faith, chapter 18, 4, the great chapter on assurance uses our text as a proof text that God withdraws himself from us and withdraws the light of his countenance from us for a time so that we would seek after him. This text is used as a proof text by the Westminster Divines on that. But let me ask, have you ever felt that, friends? Have you ever felt that distance from the Lord? You might at times go to him in the ordinances And they feel empty, don't they? It's like, where are you, Lord? Uh, You're to be here in the word and in prayer and in the preaching. But you seem so far away, and yet you seem so close to my brother or my sister who's sitting there, and they're enraptured. And it's like you're communicating with them. Why are you not communicating with me? He withdraws, and your soul fails just like hers did. Where is he? Why does he not feel as near as he once was? Why do I tremble and why does my assurance seem shaken? My soul faileth. I sought him but could not find him. I called him. O Lord Jesus, answer. And he gave me no answer at the time. Beloved, let me say, let us not presume to awaken out of spiritual slumber and presume we will find him straight away. That actually is, in a strange way, helpful for our assurance, isn't it? If we know these things, we wouldn't have the expectation that if I truly repent, my bowels are moved for him, sometimes I may not sense his presence as he teaches me to value him all the more. Because what's that doing, right? It's that distance is making your heart grow fonder for him. It's making you yearn for him all the more. And you say, I don't like it that he's away from me. I don't want it anymore. And so I will search for him. I will seek for him. But whereas if he's always there on demand, you would never appreciate him. You'd say, I'll put him off some more because I know when I'm ready for him, he'll be right there. But he does this to teach us a lesson. If you do value communion with me, don't presume upon me. Don't treat me like garbage. And he will sometimes bring a bit of panic to our soul. Where is my beloved? Now this text seems familiar. It's the same cycle we found in chapter 3. The bride slumbered then, lost sight of her beloved. 
And in that text, she ran into the city to find him. And the watchmen, that is the ministers, pointed her to him. And when she found him, what did she do? She said she would not let him go. There's an application here. The spiritual dullness is very cyclical at times. We must break the cycle of running hot and cold when it comes to Christ. The fire of religion is meant to be tended to always, as in Leviticus 16, 6-13. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Never grow complacent. Never. Every day, his mercies are renewed so you can have fire on the altar, something to offer the Lord. Well, here in chapter 5, even after she said, I won't let you go, Lord, here comes spiritual slumber again. And she repeats what she did before. She runs out into the city again. But in verse 7, the watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. This time the ministers deal cruelly with her. They wound her. They take away her veil. They rip it away as to say, right, this is a sign of modesty, isn't it? In those days. It's like they rip it from her saying, your modesty is a charade. You're a whore is what you are. And they beat her. The word smote means to strike and wounding in the text means to injure her. They deal cruelly with the bride. Now, for those of us who are ministers and elders, this is a warning. We are to deal kindly with the repentant sinner. She's repentant at this point. She's seeking after her Lord. Yes, she did wrong. Absolutely so. However, they are to be guides. We are to be guides to Christ, to the repentant. When they come to us in their sin and they say, I've repented of this, we are to point them to Christ and say, go to him. Here, let me show you where he is found in the word of God. Let me show you his promises. He has come for the chief of sinners. He says those who come to him, he will in no wise cast out. Let me show you where to find him. Go to him with your repentance and your sin. Not wound them and censure them harshly when they are seeking to love the Lord. If you are repentant, so let me act as a watchman, ought to act. If you are repentant, if you have come here now repenting of your sin and bewailing and mourning your sin, I say to you, run to Jesus. Find him in the word of God. Find him in prayer. Find him at the communion table next week as well. Go to him. And he will deal with you kindly. Seek him and don't let him, don't let up. I will not beat you. I will point you to him and don't be discouraged if you don't find him at first. That's the lesson here. He withdraws. Maybe he is withdrawn from you. Don't let up. Go to him. Just as he did not relent until he found you, as in Luke 15, you do not relent until you find him. Maybe assurance will not come quickly, but it will come in his appointed time if you seek after him. He will be found of you. Run to him. Let me assure you of this truth as well. Those who have tasted the joy, of, if you've ever tasted the joy of fellowship with Christ, and if your soul is mourning now at his distance, he will be found of you. If you've ever tasted of his goodness and communion with him, he will be found of you. Because the one who is a castaway doesn't mourn distance from Christ. In the meantime, what I would say to you is don't forget who he is. That will spur you on to find him. Here the bride meets the daughters of Jerusalem. Those are members of the visible church. She says in verse 8, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if ye find my beloved, that ye tell him, I am sick of love. So sometimes this is the interesting thing, right? Sometimes the members of the church are more sympathetic than her elders. And she goes to them and she says, when you meet him, tell him, I am sick of love. I need him. Tell him, I need him to visit with me and feed me on his love. I am sick of love. That is, I am lovesick. And the only cure is communion with him. Tell him that. Ought we not pray then for others who are lacking a sense of assurance? 
If you do lack a sense of assurance, go to others in the church and ask them to pray for you. Say, when you find my beloved, when you have communion with Christ yourself, you tell him there is one who needs him. Do that for your brethren. Well, the daughters of Jerusalem, and I have to end soon, I am aware of that. The daughters of Jerusalem are stunned at how desperate she is. You know, in some ways, they don't seem to value him the way she does. It's always sad to meet Christians who don't value our Lord Jesus, and they have little regard for his beauty. Let that never be us. Can't dwell there. But they ask a simple question. What is thy beloved more than another beloved, O thou fairest among women? What is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? How would you answer the question? What is thy beloved more than another beloved? Ought we not have an answer? I'll ask you, what is your beloved more than another beloved? How quickly could you answer? Would you know what to say? Why why is the Lord Jesus Christ better than any? If you don't know, you won't seek after him and you won't find him. The answer to it is the first step towards finding him again. Her answer is not part of our sermon text, but let me put it before you in some parts. In verse 10, my beloved is white and ruddy, or red, the chiefest among 10,000. He is the best. He is the very best. There is none that I desire but him. There is none other. I put all men, I put all things before my heart and mind, and I say he is the chiefest. There is none better. And her heart then overflows with the recitation of the grandeur and loveliness of Christ that culminates at the very end in verse 16. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is, he is how lovely? Altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. She has yet to find him. And yet her heart is so warmed to him. It's just like Peter says, you love him though you have not seen him. You ought to love him now, even though you haven't seen him. Faith in the word of God shows you he is altogether lovely. You say of Jesus in your soul, this is my beloved, this is my Jesus, this is my friend. That meditation is the means to the cure of our spiritual lethargy to remember who he is. Who is it that is knocking on the door this week? And sure enough, beloved and bride are reunited in the next chapter. Chapter 6, verse 2, she finds where he is gone. My beloved is gone down into his garden. Then will it lead into the most famous verse of the song, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. What a reunion that is. When she sees him again, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. She found him in the church, just as it was when when we began the sermon. Truly he loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob, and he is there. One of the worst things you can do in spiritual withdrawal, friend, is to stay away from church. That's your instinct in the flesh is to say, I feel far from Jesus. I just don't feel like I can go to church. That's the opposite of the remedy. That's the opposite. The worst thing you can do in a time of withdrawal is to stay away from the communion table next week. And I would say this as well, and I know I'm dealing perhaps with some difficulties here. It's not right to stay away from the church even if her ministers have beaten you in the past. It's not right. Go to another church, sure, with different elders, but don't abandon the church. You won't find Christ. You won't find Christ. And that's the step towards apostasy. There are many things that Satan uses, and wicked ministers is one of them to separate Christ and his beloved bride. Don't give up on the church. He is in his garden. You will not find him outside there, so press on. And he will manifest himself to you. It will be as before... It'll be better than before, I have no doubt. So this week, let us put away our lukewarmness and let us discover wherever or whatever warms our heart more than Christ, be it the world or sin, Jesus is calling to you, open to me, my beloved, and put that away. Think on his cross, his blood-soaked brow, 
Let us remember his love that will be shown to us in the sacrament and let us not make excuses to prepare. Let us do a work in our soul this week and let us come to the table after discovering our defects but also discovering our graces and ask the Lord to blow upon them and grow them that he would have something to dine on. Let us bring to him the fruit of repentance that he may sup with us. O friends, O beloved, O you who are called undefiled in Christ, consider him who is altogether lovely. Make this Jesus your all in all so that he says to you, open to me my love and you will open to him. May you and I do so and may he bless the preparation of our heart. Amen. Let us arise for prayer if able. Our Lord Jesus, remove from us our lukewarmness and cause us to love thee all the more. This week, O oh God, prepare our hearts. We have no doubt Jesus is saying to us, open to me, my beloved. And I pray, we pray that every soul here would open their hearts to the Lord. We pray for those who are lacking assurance now. We know some who may. We are unaware of others who have not expressed it. But we pray for them that the Lord would be found of them. Use this text. Uh, may they say with joy this week, I know where to find my beloved and he is there. And uh, Father, we pray that you would restore to all of us, especially if it is diminished, the joy of our salvation. We do not ask for those of us who are saved to restore to us salvation. We ask instead, restore to us the joy of our salvation, knowing our salvation is not lost. Help us to respond swiftly to our Lord and to keep the fire of religion burning in our bosom. We ask it all for Jesus' sake. Amen.